weapons would apply to policing in the sense that the chemical munitions prohibitions don't apply to tear gas when it's used by police, but military. I, I think I think we're now live. Is that correct? We are now yes, on. that is correct. So um, we're just going to give people a few minutes to. Absolutely. Okay, let's capture that. Yes, that is correct. So um, we're just going to give people a few minutes to. Absolutely. Okay, we're hearing the delay that occurs when we go live, which can be rather distracting. Let I, I'm okay. Let's capture that. Yes. Okay, so um, people are arriving. Okay, we're going to make sure that everybody that occurs when we go live. <laughs> okay, it can be rather distracting. Let I, I'm okay. Let's capture that. This yes. doesn't usually come from my computer. Previously, it, uh, are people hearing that delay? Okay. So um, yes, yes. Okay. Arriving. Yes. We're going to make sure that everybody. <laughs> gotcha. That was me. Mia culpa. Yeah. Okie dokie. Um, we'll just give people a chance to arrive. We've got 30 people in the waiting room and it just takes a little bit to get people in. So I'm, my apologies that we're starting a little bit late and we were having such a great time uh, chatting that six o'clock really crept up on us. Uh, so forgive me as we start off a few minutes late and we're still doing a little bit of a tech setup making sure that all the speakers are here and uh, making sure that we don't have any more tech snafus like me looping the soundtrack that we had before. And just to let everybody know that this is of course being recorded and it's live streaming to YouTube at the moment. So if you have any trouble uh, accessing the, um, the actual event, then hopefully you're going to be able to um, see it again on video or uh, see it even just as the live stream on video. But if you're here with us now, you have the chance to ask questions, which is one of the best things that uh, I find because we have fantastic speakers and we have a great audience. And the questions and the feedback from the audience is one of my absolute favorite things about doing this show. So. Let me dive straight in and say, I want to acknowledge that I am here on the lands of the Mwukma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, an unrecognized Indian nation. And in Australia and New Zealand, every important event is opened with an acknowledgement of the First Peoples. It's by no means a cure for systemic injustice, but it does start the conversation. So tonight is the second episode of Society, Robots and Us. And we're starting another conversation that matters as we address the role and the rollout of killer robots. And I believe that ethics is not a position, it's thoughtful action. And what we'll be exploring today goes beyond the positions and explores who thinks about the role of killer robots and why. And what does it take to make this discussion relevant for everyone in robotics? How do we respond to this as an ethical issue? I'm Andrew Kay, Managing Director of Silicon Valley Robotics and visiting scholar at Citrus in the Benetau Institute in the People and Robots Lab with Dr. Ken Goldberg. And I'd like to thank you all, both speakers and audience, for being active participants in this discussion. I've collected the questions and the suggestions that were submitted in advance, and we'll keep collecting questions in the chat as we go. The range of topics that are being suggested for this series is great. It's really broad, and I'm looking forward to having many more discussions and we'll be building on previous conversations as we go. For example, the topic of racism that we discussed two weeks ago, of course, leads us towards a discussion of bias in both hardware and software. And it's going to intersect with tonight's topic as we look at things like surveillance bias and uh, facial recognition and force in society, not necessarily at the hands of the military. But I think we're going to have a whole nother topic next time on facial recognition and the rollout of robots in policing in future episodes. 
If anyone has trouble accessing the online meeting, the live stream on Silicon Valley Robotics YouTube, and we'll publish the video recording and a transcript on Silicon Valley Robotics website and on the University of California's Citrus and the Benatower Institute site. In case you wondered, Citrus is not the fruit. It stands for Center for Information Technology Research in the Interests of Society. And finally, I'm going to flub screen sharing here, but let me try. I would like to say just a little bit about our fantastic uh, speakers. We have today, we have, uh, we'll be hearing from Rasha Abdul Rahim from Amnesty International, but as she's based in London, we won't be hearing from her in real time. We'll, we have a video. We'll be also hearing from Peter Asaro, Maynard Holiday, Ryan Garropy, and Ken Goldberg. Um, and speakers, please feel free to answer any of the questions in chat at any time. And my fantastic helper, Erin Pan, will be making sure we don't miss any. And unless you're a speaker, please leave your video off and your microphone muted. The first thing up, will be a video from Rasha, who is based in London, as said, and is the Deputy Director for Amnesty Tech, Amnesty International, um, International at the International Secretariat of Amnesty International in London. She heads up the AI and Big Data team, whose work focuses on challenging the systemic threat to human rights posed by surveillance-based business model of big tech companies, and ensuring accountability in the design and use of new and frontier technologies. She also leads Amnesty's work on fully autonomous weapons systems and other emerging weapons and artificial intelligence technologies. She sits on the steering committee of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, of which Amnesty International is a member, and was previously researcher advisor in the Arms Control, Security Trade and Human Rights team, where she worked on various arms control issues, including the Arms Trade Treaty, the trade in conventional arms, the use of inhumane weapons around the world, and the use and transfer of armed drones. She was centrally involved in the global campaign to secure the 2013 Arms Trade Treaty, which entered into force in December 2014. Erin, uh, I'm stopping the screen share. Can you run the video? I'm not hearing the sound yet. The campaign to stop killer robots in 2013 and the international is a member of that campaign and really what we've been looking at mostly is the human rights implications of these weapon systems so whereas the convention on sets of conventional weapons which is the forum which is examining this issue focuses on the specific risks associated to these weapon systems use in conflict we are really concerned about the implications that these systems may have on human rights and um, in law enforcement situations. And so there are a few rights who, which, which are mainly we're concerned with, which are firstly the right to life, which is guaranteed under Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or the ICCPR. And really we see a danger of these weapon systems being used to violate that right um, under human rights law, the lethal force can only be used where there's an imminent threat to um, life or serious injury and we see that these systems wouldn't be able to comply um, with that um, right uh, and they wouldn't be able to make the assessment um, on whether or not it is legitimate under human rights law to take life. Um, secondly, we're concerned about the right to freedom of assembly and so we've seen that there are specific systems, uh, semi-autonomous systems, so they're not fully autonomous at the moment, um, and they've been developed specifically for use in law enforcement. And these systems have been developed specifically for crowd control. So there are a few systems that we've looked at. We published a report in 2015, which looked at some of these systems that already exist. And one of them is called the Viot Bot, which is a um, ground semi-autonomous or remote control system, uh, which has been manufactured by a Spanish company. And that is for crowd control. So the idea is that if there's a protest, you send out this um, Viot Bot um, robot and it can disperse crowds. There's also another um, system, which is an aerial system, uh, semi-autonomous again, and it's called, called the Skunk Quiet Bot, and that's manufactured by a South African company, um, and that disperses um, pepper balls, pepper spray from the air. Again, 
uh, designed for crowd control that's been exported to India. There are reports that it has been used um, in India. Um, so, so really we see that fully autonomous weapon systems would inevitably be used in these kinds of situations. And again, would violate or could violate the, the right to freedom of assembly. This is a right that's not really spoken about, which is the right to privacy. Um, because fully autonomous weapon systems would rely on the bulk um, collection of data in order to power algorithms, which would then be able to, to select or, or engage targets, we see that that would be a violation of, of, of the right to privacy because people's data would be collected without their consent and would be collected in a non-discriminatory and non targeted way. And finally, the right to non-discrimination and the right to equality, as we've seen with other um, algorithmic systems or AI or machine learning systems, we've seen that um, discrimination can be uh, replicated through algorithmic decision making because the algorithms are trained on biased data sets um, that then reinforce biases in the way that they make decisions. And so, for example, fully autonomous weapon systems could profile people and go and target them based on the way they look, based on a belief that they may have, or based on their affiliation with a particular group. The other element related to this is international policing standards. So under the um, UN basic principles on the use of force and firearms, um, the use of force must be proportionate, it must be legal, so it must have a legal basis, it must be accountable, and it must be necessary. And really these kinds of determinations are determinations that are made after years and years of training by police officers, uh, for example, using different techniques um, to try and de-escalate a situation, um, forces to be used as a, as a last resort only, um, and so that entails police officers using skills like negotiation, de-escalation, using different types of weapons, like le less lethal weapons rather than resorting to lethal weapons as, as, a, as a first resort. And as um, machines are potentially better at, at making binary decisions, like kill or don't kill, or injure or don't injure, it's really difficult to see how um, fully autonomous weapons would be able to make decisions regarding graduated use of force, right? So. Um, looking at a situation and assessing, well, do I need to use force? Um, what is the threat? Can I use different techniques to, to um, neutralize the, the threat? Is, is force even necessary? Um, it's very difficult to imagine um, that these systems would be able to do that. And regardless of whether the technology advances to a state in which that would be possible, there's also this moral question, right, of whether we want systems to be able to take life, systems to be able to, to decide on their own who to injure and how how to injure them and that really relates to the to the right to human dignity which underpins human rights law and it's the right to to have the value of human life recognized and machines don't recognize the value of human life and so therefore is it right for them to be able to to decide on their own whether or not to take life that was a really good summary of the topic and it highlights I guess a lot of the blurred lines and areas. I tended to think that this was primarily a military um, issue rather than more generally seeing the potential rollout of, of autonomous weapon systems in society but I'm clearly wrong things are moving ahead definitely much more much more broadly than I had really been aware of, but it only makes sense if you think about things like the recent actions in, in the US, for example. So what is interesting about this is I think that the military have probably done the most research into that subject, or arguably Peter Asaro has done the most research into this subject. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Peter Asaro, who is the um, professor, associate professor at the New School and a philosopher of science, technology, and media. His work examines artificial intelligence and robotics as a form of digital media, and the ways in which technology mediates social relations and shapes our experience of the world. And Professor Asaro is also the co-founder and vice chair of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, and is on the steering committee of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. So over to you, Peter. Ah, please unmute. Right. Okay. Thank you, Andra. Um, <clears throat> I think Russia did a really good job of uh, covering a lot of the 
the ideas around uh, human rights in particular. And we've been working for a number of years with the campaign to stop killer robots to ensure that there is some kind of international regulation of weapon systems that would autonomously target and kill human beings uh, without meaningful human control. Uh, and within the United Nations, this is taking place within a body called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which is a treaty body that governs conventional weapons systems. Um, and so there's also been some discussion of how this would apply uh, as well to policing uh, and other sort of human rights more broadly. Um, historically, most prohibitions of weapons apply to everybody. Uh, with the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention, there were exceptions made for the use of tear gas uh, by police forces for domestic purposes. Uh, we've seen a lot of that tear gas being used recently in the United States. Uh, there's been a lot of demonstrations around police violence uh, against black people and people of color. And I think uh, it raises a question of should there be those kinds of exceptions for, for the use of tear gas? Uh, and just thinking about the use of force in general, uh, within the military context, uh, the laws of war are much more permissive about when it's allowable to kill and it's, you know, you get your law, if it's a lawful enemy combatant, that you can kill them uh, in a state of war. Uh, and there's not really a lot of other conditions on that. Um, but in policing, there's a lot more conditions on that. Um, you're not really supposed to kill people ever. Uh, the exception is for self-defense. And then we authorize police and other security forces to also use force to protect the public from immediate threats or imminent threats. Uh, and one of the big challenges, of course, from a, an engineering perspective is how do you identify those kinds of threats? Within the military context, what we've seen around autonomy and mil uh, military systems and lethal systems are primarily automated targeting systems that are using sophisticated radar and sensors to identify missiles, to identify uh, military vehicles, aircraft, tanks, Right? You, you don't see a lot of civilian tanks driving around or aircraft carriers or things like that. And so the, the sort of margins of error are, are pretty big uh, for getting that right. And yet we've been very active at trying to get prohibitions on us because these systems still don't understand when there's a state of war, uh, when things that appear to be enemy combatants may not actually be enemy combatants what other types of inputs might confuse these systems? Uh, how does somebody who deploy this system understand what it's going to do and then be responsible for what it's going to do and accountable for what it's going to do? Um, so even in this sort of very permissive case of international armed conflict, we think you know, uh, autonomous weapons are deeply problematic and these questions about human rights and the recognition of human dignity in the act of killing, even when it's lawful and permitted international conflict are very challenging. And then though it just gets much worse when we start thinking about domestic applications. And we've long been concerned about dictators and rulers who would use robotic automated systems that might've been designed for the military against their own people to suppress peaceful protests and things like that. Um, and I think we're also seeing a, a big discussion right now around policing and the use of technologies for face recognition, for uh, using little drones, using tear gas, using military equipment, and this kind of militarization of police, uh, which is also, I think, um, problematic. Talking to veterans, talking to people who work in military policing, a lot of the tactics that police are using today in the United States for crowd control are not even permitted by the military, right? In the same way that tear gas is not permitted for use by the military, um, but it's used by the police quite extensively. And thinking through some of these questions, um, I have a number of papers on this about when is a use of force lawful, but when is it really necessary? And I think this was what Russia was getting at as well, of being able to actually understand a context of a situation that is potentially a violent situation and understanding when should you de-escalate and then when should you escalate and what kind of force should you use if you're going to escalate. 
And that requires a very sophisticated psychological and cultural understanding of the situation, understanding the psychological motivations of an individual, also understanding what kind of threat they pose. Do they have a weapon? Are they going to use that weapon? What would the effects of their using that weapon be? Could they use something you know, like a stick or a rock that's not generally a weapon, but could be turned into a weapon in a certain context? Uh, and that would require you know, a robot or a computer system that was incredibly sophisticated at understanding a lot of kind of common sense knowledge that we really don't know at this point how to program into machines and we haven't done successfully for a long time, um, which is very different than say, just recognizing that some object meets some criteria for being a military vehicle uh, and say an object recognition system. Um, that's far more circumscribed. And even that I think is, is still problematic on many levels. Um, and this gets into questions of, you know, what does it mean if a system recognizes you as an enemy or as a threat? What is its representation of you? And is that a human representation of you such that the decision to use lethal force against you would ever justify that use of force? And machines aren't really more agents. They don't understand the nature of human life. They don't understand the implications of taking a life. They don't really understand what it means to represent you as a human, even if a you know, visual recognition system can draw a box around you and say, ah, that's a human in this image. They don't know that a human is really any different than a cat, right? Other than, you know, cats match different patterns, humans match these patterns. Um, so they don't have that kind of understanding, which means if they take your life, it's not a reasoned or justified taking of life. Ooh. Arguably, many people also fit that criteria and don't respect the human other lives. Uh, so I think we're going to have some interesting things to dive into there. I, I've got quite a few questions myself, but let's move on to hearing from our next speaker, Maynard Holiday, who's with Rand Corporation now as uh, a senior engineer leading the joint Oh, working on high stakes AI bias. And Maynard previously worked for Barack Obama at the Pentagon, where he launched the Defense Innovation Unit. And he was also the project manager for Pioneer, a robot which helped to map the inside for the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And as well as that, Maynard's been working with Bay Area public schools, lecturing on robotics and teaching robotics through the Citizen School Program in East Oakland, and was named Citizen Schools Volunteer of the Year for 2012 and was also recognized with the Presidential Volunteer Service Award from the White House for his efforts over the years. So over to you, Maynard. Uh, thanks, Andra. Um, so uh, I, I wanna start from a very personal um, perspective and that's uh, as an African-American male in the US and uh, with a uh, African-American son, um, who's a, a young man who's uh, in, uh, you know, the public sphere. And so um, I, I would posit to say that um, uh, robotic systems to assist uh, police um, uh, have, uh, should be at least given a, a, a chance and not uh, uh, dismissed given, you know, what, uh, you know, people that look like me have, have faced for, you know, the, uh, uh, duration, you know, the history of this country. So, um, you know, to say, you know, out of hand that, you know, they're not going to, um, they're going to use lethal force, uh, you know, more so than what we've already seen. Um, I I'm willing to give it a, 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 a pilot, a pilot test. Um, and, and so I would say, you know, a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, my community would, uh, would say the same thing. So, uh, I'll, I'll pivot from there to uh, the uh, uh, my uh, defense uh, depth and uh, my role at the Pentagon was senior technical advisor to the Undersecretary for Acquisition. And in that role, I was the government advisor on the uh, 2016 uh, Defense Science Board study on autonomy. And, um, and so to level set things, um, there are no lethal autonomous weapon systems 
uh, employed by the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, that's not to say that uh, it's not on the roadmap, but currently there are none. Um, and so what we uh, studied at the Defense Science Board was what are the implications of autonomy and, um, uh, you know, for the DOD. And uh, our mission uh, in that role is to make sure the U.S. is never in a fair fight um, because we want to bring our young men and women home safely and never, you know, to the extent we can put them in harm's way. And so um, our charge was, can autonomous systems save lives of US service personnel, as well as those of innocent uh, combatants? Um, so that there's not, you know, fratricide um, and more accurately employ uh, lethal force. Um, and then uh, how can we um, then use these systems to help us stand off from a potential conflict using what we call man-machine teaming to um, uh, employ systems to you know, probe an enemy's defenses and, and not put manned systems in, in harm's, uh, harm's way. And so, uh, you know, a, a lot of thought, you know, went into our analysis and um, the, uh, the point, uh, you know, I'd like to make you know, to our, uh, again, people uh, on the other side is um, the U.S. cannot unilaterally uh, commit to essentially tying one arm behind our back and saying, all right, we're not going to develop these systems, but go ahead, you know, China, Russia, um, you know, as noted in earlier presentations, you guys go ahead, develop them, uh, export them, and use them against your people, use them perhaps against us, and then, you know, we're not able to respond. Um, and, uh, you know, the way the Defense Department looked at this issue was, you know, autonomy at rest, you know, in, in cyberspace, and then autonomy, you know, in motion or kinetic. And uh, in cyberspace, um, you have to be able to react at machine speed um, to, you know, defend your networks. Um, in the uh, physical world, uh, again, sometimes you have to act at, machine speed, uh, you know, you think about uh, ships at sea being attacked, you know, by drones, you know, again, using autonomy, um, you know, that decision loop has to be at machine speed to, uh, to counter those threats. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are several types of systems, you know, man out of the loop, which is totally autonomous, and that doesn't exist yet, um, man in the loop and man on the loop. And, uh, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, talk about the, the level of, uh, you know, what Peter said earlier, meaningful human control in, uh, with those systems. But uh, um, those are the uh, uh, issues and concerns, you know, that are driving um, a, uh, a defense department perspective. So I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Maynard. Again, more notes. And in fact, recently, just very recently, I read that uh, it's believed that China is exporting uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems to Saudi Arabia or other countries in that region. But you mentioned machine speed, and that's you know one of those areas in which machines are better and faster than people. And we have a fantastic speaker in the. Uh, an audience member who really should be a speaker, and I hope she will chime in. Missy Cummings is not only a professor of robotics, but was previously a female fighter pilot and is currently on the Defense Innovation Board. So providing, um, but anyway, uh, I think when we talk about human in the loop and machine speed, I think um, I'm really hoping that Missy will share some of her thoughts with us. Uh, in fact, if you're able to join in, Missy. Hey, thank you. Um, it's funny. I, I'm actually just getting back from the pool, so I will start my video, but you guys, um, my hair is totally wet, and um, uh, I appreciate you 
asking me to jump in at such a um, random time. But um, so Peter and I have gone round and round about these issues in various capacities. And I'll send, I'll put a link up to a paper that I recently wrote that's a little controversial. You know, I mean, my time as a fighter pilot obviously has defined how I feel about um, how we use weapons. Uh, you know, obviously I'm pro-military or I would not have served in the military. Um, at the same time, you know, I also realize more than anyone else who is on this call just exactly what the human limitations are. I personally, um, in simulation, in, when we fly against each other in flight, um, we have simulated weapons that we use and we're tracked um, and we can see whether or not who we would have killed and whether or not it was a legitimate kill. And I personally have killed more people, my own people, what they call blue on blue. So, you know, I have made many mistakes just like all pilots do when you shoot weapons um, to kill your own people, much less kill people on the ground. So I realize more than anyone exactly how many mistakes humans make. And because of that, and because I've seen the long-term impact of what that does to a human. And when I say that, I'm quite sincere when I say this, I know a lot of people who have killed people. I fly, I, a lot of my friends, dropped a lot of bombs, um, both on legitimate and non-legitimate targets. Every single one of those people, and they're all men for now, um, they're never the same and their lives are ruined and they, and they are destroyed human beings. And, uh, you know, so I think that we ask a lot of people when we put them in this situation, uh, we're asking them, to kill people, it's going to destroy their lives. I'm not saying that should stop them necessarily. I do think that they're legitimate missions. However, I would like to say I'm personally glad I'm not in the military right now being asked to take on a mission that I, I don't necessarily agree with. But all that being said, um, I am not for a ban on autonomous weapons. I am 100%, I, I am the number one voice that irritates Elon Musk about how much driverless cars are not capable of doing what they do. And I feel the same way about weapons. There is no way in any way, shape or form that we have any form of autonomy that should be embedded in a weapon right now. It's just not, it just wouldn't work. That being said, I'm not for a ban because I can see under some limited environments, and again, I'll post the paper about this, especially static targeting, where autonomy today is better than humans. It is more reliable. And indeed, I feel like that we should be using autonomous weapons because not only does it prevent collateral damage and the deaths of innocent people on the ground, but it also prevents us from asking people to do missions that are outside their physical capability. And I'll stop there. I could go on all night though. Peter will tell you that. <laughs> It was going to be a, it would be a very very interesting discussion i have to say and i just thank you for sharing those very heartfelt um thoughts and your experience in this area is you know unparalleled so i i really appreciate you you taking the dive as it were straight from the pool to the to the discussion uh thank you missy and uh we have another speaker ryan garropy from clear Park who is, uh, Ryan is the CTO of ClearPath. I like to say ClearPath Robotics, but I think it's now just ClearPath and AI, just <laughs> ClearPath. And he drives research and development of the auto industrial self-driving vehicle software and guides the continued expansion of ClearPath's world leading efforts in supporting robotics researchers. Also co-founder of the Robot Operating System Developers Conference and a member of a variety of industrial and academic steering committees on the board of directors for the Open Source Robotics Foundation and Next Generation Manufacturing Canada. And one of the reasons that Ryan has a really interesting viewpoint on this is ClearPath is one, ClearPath as a company has taken a position on the subject of autonomous weapons uh, outside of say law enforcement and the military or the campaign to stop killer robots we don't tend to think of there being a role 
for organizations to play in this discussion. So Ryan, you really bring it home as it were, over to you. No pressure. And all while I'm kind of distracted by Peter's cat who looks a lot like mine. Um, so for those, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the position we took, I'll, I'll first, I'll set just as a bit of a baseline that we, we were at the time uh, six, six, or sorry, six years ago when we, when we made this public statement and, and actually even more so now we remain a uh, defense contractor. We work with, uh, we work with militaries around the world, either as a prime or, or secondary, uh, or secondary contractor. So that, that remains the case. And we certainly do believe in the need for the need for robotics in the military in general to keep people safe. Actually, I will I will clarify something as well for people who don't know where ClearPath is from. We are a Canadian company. If that if that does matter to uh, to anyone, it, if there's a certain perspective that that brings as well. Um, and I'm actually really interested. I'm really interested in reading Missy's uh, paper that she's referring to, mainly because I one of the things I've seen in the, the several years that I've been involved in this topic has been uh, a number of people on show we for simplicity's sake we'll call it the pro ban side. Who have been saying that no, we you know we're okay with certain use of autonomous weapons in, in static situations or with things like the Iron Dome system or SeaWiz or what have you, um, and but uh, people who would uh, people not wanting to to contribute or not wanting to try to to meet meet in the middle so to speak about what could be a reasonable. From a uh, from an actual use of use of force perspective, and I'm really excited to read that to read that paper and, and see what someone with with uh, Missy's immense perspective brings to the issue. Um, and as as well, I I do know that there's a lot of very valid concerns that you know, we'll just say the you know the legitimacy or power of the UN in general, for example, like how much these these treaties really control. Um, and outside outside of the use of norms, I think there is also a discussion that that sometimes the best way to defend isn't isn't a weapon of the same sort right? we know uh, we know through many you know through many different conversations that there's many different ways to stop a drone uh, a, a drone from from invading a certain certain airspace and most of them aren't other drones and I, I think there should be more discussion around that and less about if they don't if they do it then we have to do it too well, if, if they do it, then perhaps we should also be looking at defensive measures, which are um, which are more suitable. But but you know, frankly, in the last in the last year or so, nothing's nothing's really changed. You know, we we're moving at the pace. These these discussions are moving at the pace of government um, or international government, which is even slower than government. Um, but there, not so, so nothing's really changed significantly on that on that level. But there are a few things that, which have changed on the more internal level, and this is where some of the, the items of policing come up. Um, so to, to lay three points out, when we first spoke from a just pure engineering and business perspective, we were concerned about, let's say, three different items. We were con concerned that the governments had more, thought they had more control over the development process than they in fact did. Um, they thought that there was more robustness in the resulting product than, they, than in fact there was. These were politicians, not people who actually knew robotics like, uh, like Maynard and, and, and Missy. And then uh, there was the concern about just general proliferation of the results, given how quickly you can turn out robots if you put your mind to them. And what I'd say over the last little bit, now that policing is starting to come into play here and policing is starting to be discussed, we, each of those issues is actually being exacerbated. So dual use capabilities, like the ability to use actually corporate design capabilities in in military or police robotics continue to get enhanced. Um, on, the, on the plus side, we're seeing companies like literally create COVID related, COVID fighting robots from scratch in weeks. And five years ago, that wasn't possible. You needed entire research grants, but there are the bad sides to that too. Um, robustness, as, as I think Peter, Peter referred to, robustness is even more of a challenge when there are fewer and fewer ways to discriminate um, targets for lack of a better term. There's, there's less spatial separation in, in our own urban environments. There's less uh, you know, temporal separation. The features, the features are a lot more clustered together to use an AI, to use an AI, more of an AI approach. Like civilians don't tend to drive tanks around. Um, and then from a prolif pro uh, sorry, proliferation standpoint, you know, there's, there's over, I, last I heard there's 15,000 different police forces in the US 
each of which could effectively like, commission a surface system, which then gets proliferated. Um, because to come back to point one, these systems are getting cheaper and cheaper to build. Maybe not, they may not be ethical in the end, but they could certainly be legal. And I, I respect a great deal the, the people of the, uh, you know, the US and the Canadian and the international defense communities in order in their ability to assess risks, especially now that people who have some, uh, um, not now, but who, that there's, there's more and more a technical skill in those, in those fields. But in, in the average police force, they may not have that skill to assess the risk. They may just have the money to, to commission someone to, to frankly piece some things back, piece some things together with open source tools. And um, as I, I'd also say, I've, I've had re relatives who have served in uh, police forces as well. And I certainly want it, wouldn't want to remove tools from them. Uh, one of the first jobs I had was building, uh, helping build drones for first responders, but they really focused on where those drones could do good. There's a lot of first responder, or sorry, a lot of search and rescue, a lot of traffic accidents, a lot of uh, crime scene analysis. And so I think there's certainly a place there, but I do see that this may be a, uh, this is for good or bad, this is gonna only accelerate these conversations. And I think everyone needs to come together to, uh, to, help, to help decide where we want robots to, to play in this world. If it's going to be, uh, if it's going to be helping others or just um, continuing to exacerbate issues which, which we already have too much of in our society. Thank you, Ryan. You're absolutely correct. The pace of development and the ability to build robots has turned pretty much everybody into a robot, potential robot maker. And the capabilities of those robots replicate many of the far, far more advanced features. So I, I know we see ISIS utilizing consumer drones and training people in how to use them appropriately. Uh, I think I mentioned at the same time at the upper end of the scale, we have other countries continuing to develop lethal autonomous weapon systems and to potentially be deploying them overseas. In, you know, one question is, where is our greatest threat? Is it from the, I suppose, uncontrolled rollout at a local level? Or is it from the significant um, military uh, deployments with other countries? Or do we have to tackle both of these issues at the same time? And each of those issues really will, will demand a very different set of tactics as we go about this. So perhaps speaking of tactics, um, Maynard and Missy, would you like to chime in with the process through which the Defense Department determines what should be the rules of engagement for utilizing autonomous systems in warfare? Uh, Maynard, I mean, I can I can speak to that in just in the sense that you know they have a in very Department of Defense Doctor Strangelove fashion, you know they actually have a document that kind of late spells it out the DoD three thousand point nine. I think there might be an I in there somewhere. I think it's uh, just three thousand nine. Yeah, three thousand point oh nine. Yeah, point oh nine. Yeah, something nine. like that. And so they. Um, you know, they, they spell it out quite clearly. You know, the U.S. subscribes to the Geneva Convention, so um, uh, laws of proportionality, you know, th those are in all their considerations. There's a chain of command for who approves it. In terms of autonomous weapons, you know, the DOD um, is one of few governments who have actually put that in writing that they are not, you know, weapons will always be under human control for now, that's basically how the document reads. I mean, they, they do leave a little that, you know, they there's a chain of command of people in there. They say with these four people, I think, um, then we could authorize autonomous weapons to um, operate. I, my biggest concern, and I've been quite vocal about this on the Defense Innovation Board, but also, you know, just more broadly around the Department of Defense is I would worry that 
people, senior people in the Department of Defense do not understand the capabilities of these weapons and um, the manufacturers of these weapons or, you know, there, there are no weapons in, I'm not saying they're not in um, research and development, but they're not operationally deployed that would qualify as an autonomous weapon other than maybe the Tomahawk. Um, but I just really worry that there's such a misunderstanding about what autonomous are, weapons are, what their capabilities are, what makes them autonomous, how to test for autonomous. You know, I've been very vocal. Boeing, Lockheed Martin, these companies couldn't design an autonomous weapon and test it to save their lives. They don't have the people on staff to do it. And, um, and I think this is, it speaks to a larger problem of the government not just the DOD, but the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, you know, many other government organizations just simply don't have an expert base that they can draw from to let them know whether or not they can accept weapons of with any kind of complicated design and test them to some degree of satisfaction if they're if they're very software dependent. So I just think this is a national need that we that we need to address. If I may, Andre, I just wanted to add one point there and actually to, to wholeheartedly second what Missy said as that being one of the first primary concerns that got us involved was I think we saw, we read a lot of surveys and saw that members of the military were um, former or previous to, I guess, normally previous members of the military were, were very aware of what it took to make certain decisions. Um, but that a lot of uh, policymakers were we're looking, we're just assuming they got the capabilities of a Google car with the reliability of a machine tool. And it was all gonna be just, it was all just gonna perfectly work out in the end. And it's that lack of conception, that lack of understanding of risk and, and what it takes to really test this stuff that is, uh, that that was um, concerning concerning to us. So obviously I don't have the, the level of experience, but from our perspective, I, I test robots to do a lot simpler stuff and they still break in confusing and unpredictable ways on a regular basis. Yeah, and if I could add, um, you know, when we briefed the uh, Defense Science Board st study on autonomy to the combatant commands, um, almost to a, uh, a, a command, you know, they all said, wow, this is, you know, what's on the horizon looks, looks great and compelling, but if, you know, we will never use this unless you can tell us what it's doing, how it's doing it, and uh, and to whom. And so if it's not able to uh, have an auditable uh, trail that tells me that it executed my commander's intent, I'm not interested in using it. So, you know, there's this trust factor that still has to be um, overcome. And, um, and so, you know, echoing what Missy said, you know, one of the, uh, you know, reasons for standing up the Defense Innovation Unit was to uh, tap, you know, the uh, disruptive technology and innovation centers, you know, around the country with Silicon Valley being the, the first. So, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, that tech is not coming out of the Lockheed, Boeing's, Northrop's uh, uh, anytime soon. And that poses some real interesting questions around the decomposition of the technology. In, we could all be working on aspects of it without realizing, but I'd just like to introduce Ken uh, to, to weigh in before we continue answering the questions from the audience. And Ken is an artist, an inventor, and a roboticist. He's the William S. Floyd Jr. Distinguished Chair in Engineering at UC Berkeley and Chief Scientist of Ambidextrous Robotics. Ken's also on the editorial hmm. board Oh, I'll just jump in there. That's fine, Good. Andrew. Thank you. I and I'm I'm very unqualified to talk about this particular topic, so I want to just keep my remarks very brief. I'm I really appreciate the the individuals uh, that you've brought here today because this is a, an amazing amazing group. One one question I, I have is that I think it's a it's a complicated topic. If we we need to separate out, you know, the view about pacifism because and Peter I'm. I've known Peter for many years, and I'm actually curious, Peter, how you feel about, um, you know, bracketing out autonomous weapons versus weapons in general, and, you know, do you see a role that that that? I, I'm just actually kind of curious where you fall on that, 
um, spectrum and how you feel how this informs the, the decision. I also fully agree that weapon that robots are you know with Missy that robots are far less capable than 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 is popularly expected or imagined, and so we have to be very have our eyes very wide open that these systems are going to be uh, rife with with failure modes, as we've seen in so many other um, systems. But I, I wonder if the idea of autonomous weapons, how does that, how, where is this, where is the, ter the point where you just determine where something might be useful as an autonomous system that would be um, able to help clarify a field conditions and help things be more clear? Is that, is this, is the idea that as long as there's a, still a person behind the final decision, that that's okay? Or where, where do you stand on those nuanced points? Great. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, so they're directed at me. I guess I'll respond to this. No, I wasn't uh, meaning to target you. I guess right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to jump in, so it's a good excuse, right? Well, um, so I think in terms of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess in terms of pacifism, I'm, I'm not an absolute pacifist in the sense that I think there are justifications for the use of force and self-defense. And there's bad people who want to harm you and you have a right to defend yourself and you should. I think what happens much more often both in the military and in policing is that force is used when it's not actually necessary. Uh, and that a lot of the uses of force occur in situations that should have never existed in many cases, but they exist because of other kinds of social political conditions. So we can look at say, the use of drones for targeted killing and say, okay, well, yes, there's terrorists, those are bad guys, but is that the best sort of policy? Is that the best kind of approach to sort of just start dropping bombs down on people from thousands of miles away uh, outside of a sort of standard war zone? Uh, are the people who are actually being targeted, in fact, you know, high level terrorists and the data that we see from research says, well, no, in fact, very few of the people who are killed by drone strikes are in fact, right? So the reality and the, what the narrative is are often very different. But I would say in terms of, you know, weapon systems that the, the goal or the ideal from a moral perspective is that if you are going to use lethal force or violence of any form against another human, that that be done uh, in a responsible and morally deliberated way that you're conscious of it that you take responsibility for it and that the people who commit that violence are accountable and responsible for it um, and if it was appropriate then, then it was appropriate so part of the problem of sort of making it automated is that nobody becomes responsible anymore or it becomes very easy to be psychologically detached from it uh, to be legally held accountable for what happens or for the political leaders or military leaders who might order it to be held politically responsible on some level. Um, and that kind of distancing, I think, is, is deeply problematic. Uh, and I actually, you know, Missy, Missy knows we, when we wrestle over these ideas that I think it is true that there are many ways in which an automated process can be more precise uh, than a human in, in very circumscribed, well-established contexts. But you still want that human in control uh, and to Maynard's point, I think, you know, actually, if the Department of Defense directive around autonomy were made into international law that was binding on all states, that would be a good thing. I think that's a positive move. It doesn't completely prohibit autonomy. It says actually, though, autonomy should only be used in very circumscribed cases. It should be very short periods of time. It can't wander around over long areas. Um, it needs all of this kind of meaningful human control, essentially. They call it appropriate levels of human judgment. Uh, and I think the real critical issue, and it's come up a lot in the discussions of the United Nations, where states that want to build these technologies quite rapidly and think they're going to gain advantage from that say, well, you know, Article 36 reviews are going to make sure that these are, are lawful. Um, and that's uh, Article 36 of the Geneva Convention says that states have to review weapon, new weapon systems for legal compliance, essentially. But I think as Ryan said too, that 
you know, it's very, very difficult to test these systems. Um, the kinds of tests in, in the US is really at the forefront, I think internationally at doing these kinds of Article 36 reviews, but the kinds of tests they do on new weapon systems are really to see that it meets the contractual obligation right, of the manufacturer to produce something that is technically capable of achieving the capability that it's supposed to do. And they don't really test like kind of all of the, the null hypotheses or the counterfactuals or, well, what happens if we do this with it? Or what happens if you do that with it? Or what happens if you use a misconduct? They don't sort of do lots of testing. And it's not really clear even how to do that for autonomous systems. I mean, even simple robotic systems, we're constantly surprised because we put them in a new context that they weren't designed for, how they're going to act and react in those situations. And if they are capable of using lethal force, it's just a very unpredictable, very dangerous kind of situation. Um, so, right, simple just to try to avoid that uh, in general. Um, and then to say, okay, well, what are those very constrained contexts? Well, we can do that kind of testing. What's required? And I think at, at the international level, what we've been discussing is this idea of meaningful human control, which doesn't mean necessarily that a human has to do every manual operation uh, or, or you know, steer a missile or, or what have you, but that they need to have a sufficient contextual understanding to know what's happening, to know that it's justified, to know the consequences and to be responsible for that. Now, of course, humans have lots of problems too. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, questions about policing, questions about the use of the military, questions about um, also post-traumatic stress and the impact uh, of the use of force on the people who use it are, are also very uh, important. I've, I've got some papers on that as well. I think you're again, muted, Andrew. Again, uh, thank you so the much. Veteran moderator fails to <laughs> unmute. Uh, it gets me all the time. But uh, firstly, that was a really great summary of so many of these points, Peter. And uh, secondly, it really dovetails with some of the points that uh, are being made in the chat. Michael Frumkin has some fantastic points. And James, thank you so much for putting the DOD AI principles in. And in fact, uh, Addy, your question about what is the difference between testing a plane and testing a robot? I think Peter sort of steered towards that. But uh, do uh, some other roboticists want to just uh, contribute their thoughts on why it is so hard to test robots? If I take that one, Ken, or should I? Go ahead. I feel she's staring at us. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. <clears throat> well, I mean, I mean to, to look at Addie's point on, yes, it, it, I mean, it is, it is very difficult to test the plane. But what we're talking about here is not just testing the plane. We're talking about testing the plane and the pilot. And we're going beyond testing the plane and the pilot. We're testing the plane, the pilot, and the human. Like a, the plane has a, a has a human in there who, you know, I, I would I would assume, and the people who have who have um, previous or current military experience um, could correct me on, but they generally assume that the pilots or that the the humans have gone through you know eighteen plus years of understanding what the world is, you know, understanding the difference between vehicles and people, and on top of that, you have billions of years of evolution that have been you know, pre-programmed in your mind for resolving scale and resolving motion and, you know, clustering objects and all of these different things together. And robots don't have that. They still fail in, in interesting and different ways. And, and that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And yeah. not only right, is it difficult I to test, but also that, I mean, just, just another, another point is that they also fail in unpredictable ways. And that's also one of the risks here is that when they do fail, they fail in ways that are unexpected to people who don't work with robots. Um, they, and that's another thing is that, that you've got a, you've got people who have been, who just expect the robots to fail in the same that who expect the robot fighter pilot to fail in the same way as, as the, the human, the human uh, pilot. And that's, that's not the case. Oh, and I, I thank you, Ryan. I just wanted to also add, I mean, I haven't heard it come up tonight, but the idea of landmines, right, is a is an autonomous weapon that's been around for a very long time. 
and we those have been banned in 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 most uh, environments. So that is a precedent. But you mentioned Ryan the um, Iron Dome, and I just want to probably pose this one as an example. Of Iron Dome is essentially autonomous because it's basically sitting there looking for anything that's going to come uh, toward an airspace, and then it's going to launch automatically because it has to be on all the all the time, and it's going to try and intercept that. Now that's not targeting a human; it's targeting a it's an autonomous weapon, though. It's autonomy, uh, uh, um, targeting another um, missile. Is that would you would that be banned under this um, under the proposal of banning all autonomous weapons? Because that seems to be a special case. So I might jump in here. Um, I think that's a case of the meaningful human control, right? So given that there's human operators and I'm, I'm less familiar with Iron Dome, but the US has a very similar system called the Patriot missile system. And also those close end weapon system or phalanx that uses a gun to shoot down incoming missiles. And in that system, the CWIS uh, and phalanx, you have a human, a group of human operators. There's I think two operators and an officer working with them the system can be automated for like two or three seconds at a time when they know that there's a mortar attack or a missile attack coming. It's intercepted, has like self-destructive bullets, so they disintegrate if they don't hit a target, and so if they fall somewhere. Um, so there's actually a huge amount of precaution that's gone into keeping control of that system. They also know they're not fast enough on the trigger to individually target a group of incoming missiles or mortars or precise enough. Right, and I think Iron Dome is a similar that you, you, you can't be ready for all of these and that's actually doing calculations on its own automatically at very high speed to figure out where the debris from that missile intercept is gonna fall so that it doesn't fall in populated areas, right? So again, that's automation, but again, there's a human who's meaningfully controlling that system. And I think the ethical decision, as you point out, is somewhat different because it's material. It's not people. You're not directly targeting people and you're not targeting a building or a human occupied vehicle uh, where you're directly putting humans uh, at risk or making a decision to sort of actively take their lives. Um, and I think there you have a kind of higher moral standard to know that you're justified in doing it if, if you're gonna be taking human life. Those, those are, again, good points. I'm reflecting on something that Michael Funken raised in the chat around the um, effectively the costs, why there's potentially incentive for these systems to become more, to proliferate and to become used in other more civilian kind of domains. As we talked about at the start, as the cost of robotics decreases, is um, and he expressed the fear that it's easy to deploy robots in say policing once the at this point maybe the harder work is done in the military and uh, just to counter the to counter the idea of going for a ban might it not be better to go for a very rigorous system of deployments and uh, consequences that can then be used as a template to ask any other use cases, say, for example, in law enforcement or other countries can say, well, here is the bar that the military has to meet for this technology. So you really shouldn't look at deploying it unless you're willing to meet the same standard. And perhaps that's putting humans back in the loop more at the end of the process, perhaps as the the judges of whether or not something is uh, can be can be accepted. I think it's a question of what's the best way to regulate. Maybe, um, I mean, my my sense is if you had really rigorous standards the way the U.S. did it, and you could universalize that, that might be acceptable, but that's also really, really difficult when you have a hundred and some countries uh, with their own standards and different interpretations uh, and very different levels of technical sophistication and resources. Uh, and that's where I think norms uh, are very crucial. And to have a very simple, straightforward norm like, 
no lethal autonomous weapon systems or the, the necessity of meaningful human control, which I think is really an invitation to a conversation about where do we agree that this is acceptable? How can we articulate that what is acceptable and what is not acceptable such that we hold each other to account around that? Um, and I think the idea of introducing technologies with these incredible capabilities without understanding them, without the people who are using them understanding them is incredibly dangerous. And especially in contexts where there aren't those sorts of things. So if we think about giving these sorts of technologies to police in the US right now, where they're already so prone to violence uh, and bias and racism, that it, this would just be a train wreck, right? But, um, we can't get conscious of all those systems or deploy those systems in those areas. And you look at the, you know, and as Brian mentioned, there's, you know, I think it's 18,000 or 15,000 uh, police departments in the United States, and they all have different use of force regulations, which is just kind of insane. Uh, and, and none of which reach actually the requirements of the international standards for the use of force uh, by police that the UN developed in the 70s. So in a perfect world, and everybody conforming to these norms and standards, then I'd be much more comfortable deploying these systems. But I think we need to have that discussion and establish those norms before we start deploying systems. The idea that we're going to release that in the world is just going to work really well and we're going to be happy with it, I think is, is very naive. And what it's more likely to do is just replicate all the existing kind of inequities and, and harms that are already in society and politics and military intervention. Thank you, Peter. That is a fantastic summary. I'm afraid we've gone a little bit over because we started a little bit late, but uh, I know some of us have to go. Ken, do you have a parting comment before you need to leave? Well, the only thing I want to say is thank you because I have learned a lot. I think you're absolutely right, Peter, that this topic is so important. It's something that we all need to think more about and to consider these very nuanced aspects to it. So I thank all of you for your perspectives and Andrew for putting together such a such a esteemed panel. Uh, it's always a pleasure, Ken, and thank you for joining us. Missy, thank you so much for diving in uh, so, so well that you absolutely are an expert we need to hear from with, with regard to this. And I think it was a really balanced panel for which I thank my speakers totally. Uh, Maynard, I'm so pleased to get the defense perspective from you. And Ryan, the perspective of what it is to be in a robotics company who is providing systems for potential use cases and having to make that decision. What ones will we support? What ones won't we support? And I would love to see more companies being explicit about what they consider to be their ethical stands and their ethical processes, uh, rather than just treating it as an ethic washing. Are there any final comments from any of the speakers? And again, thank you to the audience for great, uh, really great um, questions. I mean, just as a very, very minor note, I think this is a, an opportune time to, to have this conversation because this week is uh, 4th of July and Canada Day both. So as I think it uh -huh. was uh, accidental, but I think it, it is a good um, uh, Canada Day is tomorrow for any any other fellow Canadians in the audience. So I will certainly be reading Missy's paper during it. And I think it, it certainly is relevant. That's wonderful. And I'm inspired to actually tackle facial recognition next because we've just scratching the surface of the topics around Robots, force, surveillance, um, human dignity, uh, bias, and racism. And it's all kind of coming together right now in very, very important fashions. And we want to have the conversations that matter here. So unless there are any more comments, I do have a habit of cutting people off there. But I think um, outside of that, it's time for us to say goodbye. Yeah, thanks for organizing, Andra. Another great conversation. Thank you so much, Maynard. And thank yeah, you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. We're collecting questions, and I'm looking forward to putting together a more nuanced post, incorporating the links and the feedback that we've been collecting through the chat and continuing to answer questions if we didn't get to your question. 
look for a post in the next couple of weeks. And thank you everybody for your, for your time. Bye now and Bye. happy Canada Day, happy 4th of July and happy the rest of the week for everybody else. <laughs> okay.